You're not afraid of failing. You're afraid of what other people will think of you if you fail. But if you're afraid of that, imagine what they think of you when you aren't even trying. Oh yeah, they aren't. I'm such a dick sometimes. Um. <laughs> Does it, is, it, is it strange to hear your like angry toilet tweets read back to you now in the cold, harsh light of day? <laughs> God, that was a particularly difficult poo I was cracking out there. You know, real talk, the, the tweets that I have, people don't know this, but the tweets are notes to self. Yep. So they're just directed at me so that I can look back on them and like be reminders of like, hey, don't do not do that. And so like, I think to myself, man, I'm afraid of doing this. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm afraid of what this person's going to think about me. Because if I were to be able to fail in quiet, in complete isolation, then I wouldn't care. And then I think, well, what if I, what if I, what if I don't succeed in public? What do they think then? nothing, right? They don't think about me at all. And so obviously that comes from the perspective of uh, seeking to gain approval and attention from others anyway. So it's like, listen, if you're insecure, which everybody is, let's be real, um, you might as well use the insecurity to get something out of it, right? Like one of my one of my favorite things about entrepreneurship is like use what you've got. And so a lot of people think that they need to fix their conditions in, in order to get like the perfect conditions before they start. But the perfect condition is whatever one you're in because it gives you whatever assets you have. That's the cards that you're dealt. And so it's, you just play the hand. And a lot of people have great cards. It's like, man, I'm so afraid of it. It's like, use it. It's like, I have nothing. What makes you very dangerous because you have nothing to lose, right? Like one of the um, really interesting things about I think about it from a business perspective, but it probably applies to everything is that there's always an advantage and a disadvantage from every position, right? So like, I remember when, I mean, gym launch is still a big company and still continues to grow, but in the gym licensing space, there's not many people who can compete with us there. Right. And I would talk to guys who are in the space, you know, I would talk, you know, talk at a conference, whatever. And, you know, younger guys would be like, well, I want to, I want to be in the space too. And it's not fair because, you know, you have this big advantage. And I was like, you have a way bigger advantage than I do. And I was like, because if I were in your position, I would go to every single gym owner and be like, you don't want to be with Jim Launch. You don't want to be with Alex. You're just a number to him. Like, you're never going to talk to him. Like, you're just a cog in the wheel there. With me, you're going to get my personalized attention there. He's just some employee down the chain that's following some process, right? I was like, but on the flip side, if I'm talking to that same gym owner, then I'm going to say, you don't want to talk to Jimmy. He lives in his mom basement. He has no proof <laughs> that he's good at what he's, what he's at. The reason that we're number one in the space is because we've done it so many times and we have a system that we know that if you go on this side, you will get this result on the outside. I was like, there's always a position and there's always an advantage. I was like, you just have to play the one you've got. And most people just look at what everyone else's advantages and don't think, which one do I have? When you're talking about, it's not you that's afraid of failing. Yeah. You're afraid of other people's opinions about yeah. why you're going to fail. Like, the reason I think that cynicism is so popular on the internet is that the upside of never trying is never having to feel the pain of failure. Yeah. That's fundamental. It's sour grapes at an existential level right? It is a cynicism safety blanket. It is protecting you from ever having to feel the downside of anything. I will assure yeah. my own failure in private so that I never have to face my failure in public. It's kind of like investing. Like everyone's afraid of losing money when they invest, but the only guaranteed investment that doesn't work is never investing to begin with. And so it's like they take the long failure rather than the short one. Right. I mean, it's what it is, right? You just fail long <laughs> and they're like, I prefer that. Um, but that's, I mean, that's, yeah. I, it's, it's like you and I are going back and forth on trying to figure out how many different ways can I say that either the people that you're worried about judgment are going to die or that you're going to die, or that even if you do achieve the thing, they won't care anyways. Or if you don't do anything, they won't think about you to begin with. And don't you want to be thought about to begin with? Like, don't you want some level of significance? <laughs> I just, you're going to die. And I think like, I was, I was very grateful. That, so one of my biggest inspirations or whatever, you know, influences when I was in Baltimore was I would have lunch with my grandfather three times a week. So he was 90, old guy. So I'd go to the nursing home and we'd have lunch three days a week. And listening to him talk about the regrets that he had in life, it's so much more painful to watch someone who has no options left. Like he's going to die. I mean, he's going to die tomorrow. And he died a couple of years later. I mean, like, and he, he lost all his mental faculties, you know, almost sadly. Basically, when I stopped, when I left Baltimore, one of the sad parts is I was one of the only people that kind of like kept him 
lucid. You know what I mean? And after that, no one really, no one really visited him. No one really did anything. And so I think he, he just rolled downhill. I think the lunches might've been the only thing that he looked forward to. And, um, seeing someone old with no options and nothing but regret. Now, not that he had everything to regret. He had things that he did really well. And I took those things from him. Um, it, it, he would he would repeat the same lessons you know like every lunch this be where a lot of older people kind of repeat a few key lessons and everything that he had he flew during you know he fled during the um during the world world war ii uh you know he fled from the germans and all that stuff because he had a, a jewish sounding last name um he wasn't but he it was enough that he was fleeing right um and he always used to say he's like you have two hands and one brain i was like use them and that was always this thing that he said to me and um I think just like when, th- when I th- would think about the things that he was going up against compared to the things that we're going up against now, it just made me feel like, all right, like this is not as big of a deal as I really think it is. I don't have Germans at the, at my door. You what know? were the regrets that you had? Him? Yeah. He would have spent, I mean, again, there's deathbed regrets and then there's real life regrets, but there's, there's things that he would have done differently in terms of the business. There's things he would have done differently with his wife. He had, he got divorced, um, that, you know, uh, he would have done things very differently with his kids. So my mother, um, and her sisters, um, which actually talking to him about how he raised my mother helped me in some way forgive her for some of the things that I felt were wrongdoings that she had done to me. And so. It's funny because, you know, one of my favorite quotes from Blaise Pascal is to understand is to forgive. And like when you, when you, I think there's another saying that I like a lot, which is it's really hard to hate close up. It's like, if you really see someone and you see all the things that they went through and the things that they, that happened to them to become who they are, then you understand them. And then you understand why they did X, Y, and Z. Because if we don't understand, we assume that it's because they're just evil people. And most people aren't that way. They're this way because they've been reinforced or punished for doing something like that in the past. And especially for her, she was reinforced for acting a certain way over and over and over again to the point that it was, it was core to her character. And so when that got put on me, I was like, I hate you. You're terrible. You're evil, like blah. But like, when I looked at it on a much longer time horizon of like, she was four years old when she came here, she couldn't speak English. She got beat up as a kid, like all these things. I'm like, you know what? Maybe give her a little grace, you know? And I remember when, when I came back and it was right around that same time where I realized I was giving this person all this power. She yelled at me for something when I came back home from college, my freshman year. And it was a standard fight, you know, like here's the button that I pressed to get into the normal fight that we get into. Um, I just remember she hit the button. And I just like, wasn't that upset. And I, it's like, I felt nothing. She like hit the button. She like hit it again harder. And I was like, and I just remember looking at her and being like, I get it. I'm sorry. Like you had a tough, tough life. And then she just broke down and, you know, started crying because it was like, she felt understood. And I think, um, I know that was a roundabout way of getting back to regrets, but he regretted how he had raised her, but his, through his regrets, I got to see why she was the way she was. And then it diffused the bomb that was between me and her. Did I tell you that story Douglas Murray told me about regrets from Christopher Hitchens? Mm-mm. Brilliant. So Christopher Hitchens, one of the new atheists, uh, was sat in some British pub with Douglas Murray when Douglas is young. And you know, you can imagine it's some musty Chesterfield sofa. He's probably got a cigarette in his mouth and a <laughs> glass of scotch or something. And uh, Douglas is vacillating between these two different choices that he needs to make. And he is um, complaining, lamenting the fact that I have this thing, but I have this thing. And if I do this thing, I can't do this thing. And, and, and what, what do I do? And apparently Hitch like sat back and <sighs> Douglas, in life, we must choose our regrets. Mm. And I was like, fuck. So I'm three Manhattans deep in Douglas Murray's apartment in Manhattan at two in the morning and he sneaks off to the toilet and I quickly write this down because I know that my like half cut yeah. alcohol brain isn't going to remember <laughs> it. So I note it down. That was all the trigger that I needed, yeah. which is also a good argument for noting things down. And I reflect, I must reflected on that for a year. I must have thought about it for a year. In life, we must choose our regrets. What the fuck does that mean? Okay. First off, in an existence where opportunity cost is baked in because you don't get to split test life and by doing a thing you can't do a different thing i have the choice between going to the gym and going to the theme park if i go to the gym therefore i can't go to the theme park even if the decision of going to the gym was the right call i will always have the open loop of 
Yeah, but what if I'd gone to the theme park? You can't ever know, yeah. right? Okay, so that means that fundamentally, regrets are baked in to our existence. And I'd always thought that the reason I had a regret was due to some suboptimal decision yeah. I'd made. If only yeah. I'd made this decision better, I could have ameliorated the regret. Okay, so regrets are an unavoidable part of being a human, and they're a byproduct of opportunity cost, which you can't get away from. But what does it mean that you have to choose your regrets? Okay. Well, if regrets are inevitable, if they're going to happen no matter what, an easy way to look at a decision is rather than which do I want to do, which regret could I live with? Mm -hmm. Because there are certain regrets that you can't bear living with. Now you can bear living with them, but they're going to be worse than other ones. Yeah. So what is the difference between I need to have a difficult decision, I need to have a difficult conversation with my boss about leaving to go and do this thing, or I need to, that's the regret, that's one regret of the sitting down yeah. and seeing them face to face and telling them you're going to leave their small mom and pop business and you're the yeah. main salesperson and it's going to be terrible and they're going to cry and you're going to feel like a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. That's one regret. Another regret is looking back at a decade that you waste in a job that you fucking hate. Yeah. So in life, you have to choose your regrets. I love that as a decision making frame because it also jumpstarts our fear engine. Because rather than saying like what do I want, it's what do I what do I hate least. And so we get to run it so then you get to use your run away from engine rather than your go towards to it, <laughs> yeah, the right? Mouse and the cheese again. Yeah. And w was it you who was telling me that Yeah, uh, with the cat? Yeah, I mean, yep. So I, I'm just going to butcher what you told me. Um why don't you share that like yes. how much yeah, yeah yeah this was on our last episode so yeah. this is the sequel for the people that were listening yeah. um jordan peterson talks about the study where they starve a rat and they put it into a tube they waft the smell of cheese in from the front and there's a spring attached to the rat's tail so they can work out how hard it's pulling how hard it's pulling is a proxy for desire for how much it wants it and you'd think this rat is starving it's going to pull as hard as it can so it, they waft the smell of cheese in and it runs towards it and whatever. They do another iteration of the study. This time they waft the smell of cheese in from the front and the smell of a cat in from behind. Yeah. It pulls harder. Yeah. Why? Because not only in life do you want to run towards something you want, but you want to run away from something that you fear. And this ties into your the three most common traits of yeah. very successful people, superiority complex, yeah. uh, massive crippling insufficiency, yeah. and impulse control. Yeah. So superiority complex i can achieve this thing that's yeah. the cheese um crippling sense of insufficiency i fear the cat impulse control i'm in a tube I'm there is only one direction yep. that i can go i don't need to make a choice yep i love this a lot as a frame for 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 decision making because that like think about the decision that we were just talking about right so it's like i'm i'm the sales guy and i stay and like if you were to frame it in upsides, it's like upside is I keep these friends, right? Um, and but I want to leave so that I can start this business, right? Those are the upsides. But when you think about it in terms of like I waste a decade of my life not living the life I want, to me, I mean, even when I say it, it sounds more motivating, even though it's the exact same thing. It's like losing $100 versus gaining $100. People have three times higher loss aversion. And so it's like, if you can't get yourself to do something, think about it from the perspective of what you have to lose rather than what you have to gain. You've got a quote that I love. My biggest fear is getting to the end of my life and thinking I wasn't good enough. What's that mean? And I'll define good enough as I could have tried harder. Like I want to leave everything on the field. And one of the things that has helped me a lot, I mean, in the quote that went unbelievably viral. Um, do you want me to do it again? Do I need to do it again? <laughs> <laughs> you don't gain confidence by saying, shouting affirmations in the mirror, but by stack, giving yourself a stack of undeniable proof that you are who you say you are. Outwork yourself out. And again, a lot of the tweets that I have are notes to self. Because like, like I have a, you know, I have a big presentation coming up. We got 500,000 people who are registered for this book launch um, that are coming out. And I'm thinking to myself, it's like, how can I guarantee that when I step off stage, no matter what happens, I feel like I've accomplished, that I've done a good job, that I can look at myself in the mirror and say, good work. And when I was younger, I used to have no way to do that. And that's because I measured everything on outcomes. But I feel like as I've gotten a little bit more experienced, I do have a way to win now, but it's hard. And the way that I win is when I finish and I say that there's nothing else I could have done. 
And so that means that like the reason that I feel confident about this book that's coming out is I wrote 19 drafts of the book, four full rewrites end to end to make the book. I did six hours a day, my first six hours from 6 a.m. till noon every day for two years to get this book to where it is now. And when I was done with the book, I was like, there's nothing else I can do to this. Like, I, this is it. There's nothing else. Like, I can't make it simpler. I can't make it shorter. I can't cut it. I can't add an, a visual that I should have added. It's done. And so to the same degree with the presentation that I have, I gave myself this framework of like, okay, well, if I were to speak in front of 10,000 people, I would probably spend a good amount of time prepping the presentation to make sure it was good. And I was like, well, I'm going to speak in front of 500,000. I was like, so I can, I can rationalize spending 50 times the amount of work and effort and time to make this thing exceptional. Because I mean, the numbers are hard to fathom, but that is the numbers. Like if I had a 10,000, that's what I would do. And so it allowed me to take a presentation and, you know, I have 900 slides that I'm going to get through in 60 minutes. And I have now every single day, I do a full draft of the, you know, I, I, I'd say the, say the presentation in my head. And then I do a second run where I say it out loud and I record it. And then after I record it, I play the recording with the slides up and I fix or add every slide where I stumble or there's something that should be there or visual. And I keep going until now, right now I'm a week and change out and there's, there's not much else I can do to it. And so I'll still continue to do that from now until the day that it happens, but I probably won't have as many changes because I should just keep nailing it. And then when I get up there, it doesn't matter if the tech doesn't work or if the, you know, the, the book shopping page cart, you know, doesn't, you know, doesn't work or whatever it is, because I'll be able to step off stage and look in the mirror and be like, you did everything you could. And the thing is, is like, no one else will know that because I know that like, I could not do that. And I probably like, you know, a lot of people were like, dude, you have so much goodwill. You could probably just say like, here's, you know, here's the book. Um, but I would know. And if I, if I believe what I say, I do which is that I'm the ultimate judge, jury, and executioner of my own self-esteem, then I'm the only person who can say good job or not. And unfortunately, I have incredibly high standards. And so I can either just always feel like a failure because I always fall short of my own standards, or I can create a standard that I, I willingly and consciously accept, which is that I will do enough work that there is nothing left to be done. And that means that I can also do fewer things which means I have to be more selective about the things that I choose to do. But when I do them, they will be done well and they will be done right.